first question is what gave you the courage to start the institutions and to take the risk of not following the design path and start getting into the <laughs> hey, look, to be perfectly honest, um, you know, from the day I decided, from the day I thought I should get back to Ghana and help with education, to the day I left Microsoft, I, and from the day my wife gave me her permission to do this, uh, it took about a year and a half before I quit, after my wife said, yeah, let's go. Um, so I wasn't all that courageous, um, is, is, is the answer to your question. Um, the reason I uh, eventually left uh, Microsoft, though, was that I became afraid of something else, which is um, that if I, if I didn't at least try, that there might come a day in the future when I would regret not having just felt that it was super important that we turn education around in Africa and that we be more intentional about educating the leaders of our, of our continent. Um, and so, um, so that's really, I became afraid of something else. And then I went to business school as <coughs> partly to learn how to run an enterprise, but also, frankly, partly to manage my fear. Uh, well, <clears throat> actually, um, when I first had the idea for the new book, I ran away from it. So I had been running ALA for about 10 years, and I was tired of being at home again, and having to stress with all the things that were going wrong, the payroll, and all kinds of things. So, so <laughs> 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 here's this idea, and I tried to convince three different people that I knew who were social entrepreneurs to take it. I raised some funding and got someone else to run the organization. Um, and I thought, I'll just be on the board <laughs> and you know, share ideas. Uh, but uh, <clears throat> ultimately, um, you know, I realized that uh, the impact that we could have uh, was so big uh, and that uh, I had been. Sometimes uh, you'd have to do things that make you uncomfortable, that you just say you don't want to do, but you would have a better purpose than yourself. And, uh, and that can really help you. So that's what actually got me to get back in the game and say, okay, I'm going to do this for the thing that's tough. Okay. So, what was the first thing that you were scared of what would happen if um, you didn't take this step and you were thinking about the what significant gap in the education space do you think is not being addressed by higher education at the moment? Maybe I can go first. Uh, well, I mean, where do I start? Uh, I think the, the higher education system in many ways is broken. It was designed for a world uh, that existed 200 years ago where information was, was scarce. Going to get educated was about acquiring knowledge and information. And today, the information is ubiquitous. So I believe that the institutions haven't changed their purpose. I mean, the purpose really is to shift from a physical space that transmits knowledge to an institution that prepares people to learn and to keep learning for the rest of their lives. So, you know, what I call moving from just in case education <coughs> when you go to school and you do all the in case you ever need to use it, to just in time education, where you learn skills uh, that will enable you to keep learning for the rest of your life. And acquiring the knowledge has been the main uh, focus. I also think that uh, the pedagogical approaches that uh, most universities use uh, are boring, uninspiring, and leave students disengaged. Uh, so there's a new and better ways of doing things. Time of in 
institutions that create a bubble and uh, you come into that bubble of failures and then you go off and you just make things back to the real world. And that needs to end. So how do you make those barriers, those things clean, and now it's almost back to the real world? So, and then finally, um, you know, leadership and entrepreneurial skills. systems across the continent were designed and implemented during the time of empire and the age of empire. And they were designed to educate people who would follow instruction and further and basically implement what was coming out of London or Paris or, or wherever. So they weren't really designed to um, educate problem solvers um, or people who are creative and innovative and, and that sort of thing. Um, second, as Fred has said, they were, ed they were sort of designed at a time when education was really about transmission of knowledge. Um, now, the thing about knowledge, first of all, is that it is growing at an exponential rate. And we've got to a point where we cannot uh, teach people all the knowledge that they need. Uh, no, 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 no one can uh, hold all the knowledge they need for their life, for a lifetime of their career. Um, and so as Fred has said, we need to be teaching people how to acquire knowledge, how to learn over, over a lifetime. We also need to educate people. You know, education shouldn't just be about the transmission of knowledge. It should also be about developing skills, and it should also be about developing character. I would say that the most important thing that education should accomplish is enlightenment. So education is a project of enlightenment, and we need to change the the way we educate young people um, so that they're truly enlightened, so, they're, they're, so that they have compassion, that they really care, so that they have an expectation that problems will be solved, so that they have the, the capability, the ability to solve those problems, and they have the expectations that they will be part of solving those problems, right? Um, and if we do that, um, then they will navigate the present and the future um, and will lift Africa up. I don't think that our educational systems currently are doing that. I mean, we're not there yet. Um, but the effort is starting, and uh, we just need to push it with light wheel. And it will gather tremendous momentum. Um, what do you think that the other institution does really well that um, we might have overlooked? Uh, well, I can start. I think one thing that uh, Patrick has done really well, um, and that Ashes has done really well, is really um, being much more explicit about the importance of character across uh, in its curriculum and in its culture. Uh, and you know, things like the honor code. calling out one of the four values and things that they do in the Shesha Sanji. Being clear at ONU, it's implicit, it's something that we all believe in, and uh, it's something that uh, I think we definitely uh, live as much as we can and we're hoping to teach those values in the way that uh, explicit. 
<laughs> so look, I think that wellness um, is. Uh, I mean, I, I like I like the fact that you use the word wellness. Um, I'd say, well, we, you know, how how do we have uh, an environment where people do have a sense of well-being in spite of the pressures of academic work, uh, in spite of uncertainty. And there's some things that we do which are formal. I mean, you know, we do have an office of student affairs. Uh, we have uh, counseling. We have a health center on campus. We have resident assistance. We have public health uh, education that we do on campus and all of those things. But I think all of those formal things are just a small So we, you know, I try to have a, build a culture where um, there's really a sense of partnership um, at our institution. So you don't uh, subscribe to the notion that uh, the faculty are the most important, or the administration are the most important, or the students are the most important. Well, we're all equally important. I try, I try to have an exterior. that this sets a tone for the whole the whole organization um, that we pay attention to the little problems uh, and deal with them before they become big problems uh, we currently for example way they're building a relationship with, with, you know, with the health of campus. Um, but they're 
also sharing information um, when issues are not a big, big problem. I also eat in the cafeteria um, whenever I can. Um, and, uh, you know, sometimes I'll go sit with students, sometimes I'll go sit with administrators or faculty. The idea is it's just a way for us all to be connected all the time. Uh, and I think that's all part of the fabric demonstrating compassion towards others. And so as part of our curriculum, we have this community service requirement, we call it service training. And every student um, gets involved with the community at some point. Um, as part of the curriculum, they get graded for it. But it turns out that they've gone beyond that to do it also in extracurricular activities that they're doing. And I, I believe that in addition to mechanism for training people who will, educating people who will have that concern for society for a little while. It is actually good for them as individuals, so that their, their own sort of emotional um, makeup is strengthened by engaging in that thing. So those are some of the things that we that we do, um, and then the rest of it is just learning. So that's not a yes or no question. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yes, 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 we want it, but she said, what, is, what can we expect, right? So, uh, so yes, we would like to have a collaboration. I'd say there are two things that I would, I would throw to Fred. One is that, hey, look at the today. We have student exchanges signed agreements with universities in France and are about to start exchanges with them. Uh, we don't have any student exchanges with universities in Africa. Why not? Mm. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we should fix that. <laughs> it, should, it should be possible for an HSC student to come here for a semester and for an ALU student to come to HSC. And get credit. And get credit for it. <laughs> and the credit is transferred. And I think with the major that you're starting with, second thing is that I mean, Fred and I both think about scale, um, and we're approaching it differently. Right? So the way, the way I see the, the question of scale, um, the, three, the three models. One is you replicate yourself. You set up multiple campuses. You go in, in 20 countries, then the students each, that's Fred's model. Um, so, the, and you know, University of Phoenix or Laureate and some other universities have done this. Um, the second approach is that you replicate your idea or your dream program out somehow to other entities. And this is, I would say, the model of Harvard and Princeton and Yale and others. But it is also, in a way, sort of why Android is everywhere is because it's available to everyone to, you know, they can take it and inject it into their platform. The reason why Linux has been so successful. But the question is, can we do that in Africa so that we create um, really an ecosystem of great African universities, each of which might have a slightly different character than the others, but have the certain things that are core similar, um, that builds this groundswell leadership uh, element. And that's an approach 
that um, Shesi is going to be piloting this year and starting to proactively uh, figure out how do we share our ideas with others. And so we're setting up this collaborative. Um, and I think it would be it would be a great thing if AOU could be part of that collaborative. We all meet together. Maybe you would start meeting in Ghana, but, <laughs> <laughs> but, but we can meet here too, right? <laughs> so, Let's get universities from across the continent to get together and share our model with others and inject the Shesi, uh, Shesi's ideas into other institutions, inject AOU's ideas into other institutions, and pick up ideas from the other institutions that we think will strengthen us. Right? Now that's a that, that's another that's another way to reach scale. Um, then there's a third way, which is influencing. something that, uh, you know, influencing an accrediting system, we're sort of going from not a position of strength relative to them, but perhaps we could think of it as a position of strength in terms of we're implementing and we're learning and we can be bold about sharing our ideas with them. So, and, and again, that sharing Quite yes, yes, just yes and no because it's com it's complex. But um, uh, as for the replication thing, I think better friend. I mean, he has he has more the the real assist. <laughs> I mean, one of the one of the uh, thing that actually came out this week, you know, having all these different organizations together. Uh, the thing that the name of the group that means collaborate. Right? So there's another uh, person. <laughs> One of the other people is a gentleman named Jose Zabu, who's the founder of Perhaps 20 Years. He's just about to head up Open University in Costa Rica. So he was there. And uh, what he was talking about at his website was creating a, a consortium between AOU, Ashesi, and Perth. Exchanges, European exchanges, and so forth. Uh, and also, similar to what Patrick was saying, this consortium that would, of universities, uh, both in the emerging markets, that are thinking differently about education, uh, and that can come together to put a proposal of ideas and talk about it at institutions like this. I think you've heard of the G20. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much.